Matthews? Here. Gage? Here. Harris? Present. Isom? Here. Kiefer? Here. Severton? Here. Singy? Here. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everybody. Uh, first thing we have on the list is a couple um, public hearings. First public hearing is on ordinance 1680, I mean 1807, increasing the wastewater rates. Anybody here to speak to that? See, and then we'll close that one. We have public hearing on ordinance 1608, increasing electric rates. Is anybody here to speak to that? We'll close that hearing. It brings us to ordinance, um, hearing on ordinance 16, 1806, increasing water rates. Anybody here to speak to that? See, and then we'll close that. It brings us down to communications. On the table, we got a, um, a resolution that I'd like to add to the consent agenda providing comments on the proposed amendment to the 2008 Congress Land and Resource Management Plan. That came from Dick. Um, Dick, when we go through the um, consent, if it gets, um, there's no um, people against it, I'll let you talk about it for a minute. Okay. All right, before they vote. Um, we also have an update from the borough's um, vote on the cigarette tax, and we have a lay on the table on the um, telecommunication on access from Nexus Pool. Uh, that brings us down to persons to be heard, and we have Ben Hoffmeister. Hopefully, I pronounced that correctly. We're close. Uh, hello, everyone. Yes, you did pronounce it correctly. Uh, my name is Ben Hoffmeister, and I've been asked uh, on behalf of the Wish Board of Directors, which I'm a member of, uh, to come uh, present if there's any questions from any members of the council. Um, I'm in your house. I don't know what proper procedure is. Uh, what I was advised is to come up here and basically ask if there are any questions. I know we, we uh, had something for you for distribution. Um, I'm, I'll be here through the action item um, to ask, answer any questions as well, but I just, I guess, I'll pose that if that's all right with Mayor Williams to any of the members of the council if I can answer any questions. Huh? Anybody questions now? All right. All right. Thank you, and I will be here. Thank, thank you. you very much. All right. Um, next is Terry Burr. Good evening. I'm Terry Burr. I live at 1160 Park Avenue, and um, I'm here to speak to uh, unfinished business um, item five, I believe, which goes to community funding. And um, I'm here because that funding affects the girls on the run, run program at WISH um, at IROC. And uh, that's a pretty great program for our community. I was a foster parent a few years back and the child that I had uh, was enrolled in that program and it was wonderful. I got to learn about Girls on the Run because, um, because of my foster child. And so I uh, learned that it also, this, this program helps uh, Ketchikan girls and their self-esteem and uh, self-care. And uh, uh, back in the day when I uh, enrolled the, the child I had, uh, there was a waiting list. Uh, uh, there weren't that many girls um, that could uh, be in the program. I think it was 11 or 12. And now um, we're up to, let's see, I heard last year it was 20, 20 girls at each school. So, uh, and I just really love that the Ketchikan Running Club um, gets involved and so it's a pretty big community program and so I'd really hate to see uh, the funding for that um, get cut because it's a great benefit to our community. Um, growing up a, a female in Ketchikan is not easy and this program is pretty wonderful and it's, it's so healthy and uh, it's a lovely program so I really hate to see that affected. Um, so that's what we're, so please uh, um, I'm speaking in favor of uh, um, providing providing the the funding. And that's all I have to say. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Oh, we got a question. Jenny? I have a question. So that sixteen thousand dollars goes to fund that girls For on the girls run. Girls on the run. That's right. Okay. That's what, exactly what that fund funding goes to. Thank you. Thank you. All right. That brings us to Kathleen.
Hello, my name is Kathleen Light. I'm the director of the Arts Council. I just want to give you a quick update on what we've been up to. Uh, in the month of January, our gallery exhibit was Sounds Abounds, a solo exhibit by Ruth Eddy. It was a visual exhibit of sounds that she's been collecting over the years. Um, and if you didn't see it, it's a difficult one to describe, uh, but it was fabulous. We had about 472 people come through the gallery to see it. Um, the beginning of February, we had the Wearable Art Show, um, and I want to thank the city for partnering with the borough on providing the shuttles to get people up to the Ted Ferry Civic Center. Um, about 345 people rode the shuttles, and uh, what we noticed is that uh, one family member would drop off the rest of their crowd and drive down the hill, <laughs> get on the bus, and come up. So it was really efficient, um, allowed a lot of people to get up there, and I just want to thank you very much. About 1,700 people went to the wearable art show. There's about 200 volunteers that participate in that, and that wouldn't have been such a success if people couldn't have gotten there. So thank you so much for making that happen. Um, the Wearable Art Show Gallery exhibit is up right now in the Main Street Gallery. We have about 17 artists in the gallery. Um, those pieces are selected by our gallery committee from the Wearable Art Show, and they're selected because they uh, have some sort of extraordinary either material or craftsmanship or so clever that you wouldn't, and you may not be able to see that from the from the audience. So those pieces are, are fun to look at up close. So we invite you to come and check those out. Um, it's absolutely worth the time. That comes down at the end of February. We just started our Saturday morning art class, our spring art class. This has been going on for about a year. This is our second session. Uh, Laura Kanunen is the teacher. We have two sections, first through third grade and fourth through seventh grade. Um, and the first through third is full, and we have a few spots for the fourth through seventh. So we're hoping to fill those up as we go along. Our Arts Uncorked program is going strong. Uh, we've had to add encore classes to each one. This month is Watercolor with Marilyn Lee. Uh, the first class is tomorrow night, which is full. And the second encore class that we needed to add is next Friday, and we're almost full on that one, too. So definitely uh, hitting, a, hitting the bell with the uh, community with that uh, program. Basic Arts Institute. I hope that you remember uh, our Basic Arts Institute a couple years ago. The Arts Council applied on behalf of Ketchikan educators to bring the Basic Arts Institute to Ketchikan. This is a program administered by the Alaska Arts Education Consortium which is an, a nonprofit, statewide nonprofit, and they provide this program to um, communities all over Alaska. It is an expensive program, but what they do is give educators, uh, first of all, it's a chance for continuing education, which they all have to have to keep their certification. But it provides an opportunity and tools for them to incorporate arts, arts mediums and creative thinking into any curriculum, and they do it very well. So we have been able to get a CrossFit Fund grant for $10,000 to help pay for this. The Ketchikan Wellness Coalition is gonna partner with us, and the school district is gonna kick in if we can get 15 teachers to participate, which should be pretty easy. So we're really excited about that. We're gonna do that in June right after school lets out. And that's all I have. Any questions? Bob? Yeah, um, where is that uh, Saturday uh, morning class going to be held? It is in our classroom, which is in our lower level. So right now, uh, the gallery, the main, if you go over there, we are using every square inch of that space pretty much every hour of the day. So those kids fill up that little tiny room downstairs and have a blast. Thank you. You bet. Thanks, Kathleen. You bet. Uh, that brings us down to Nora DeWitt. Welcome, Nora. Hi, I am Amy Rose and council members. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for your past support of WISH funding that uh, it has helped our prevention program quite a bit in the past and we sincerely appreciate that. Um, I'm here to um, speak in favor of the funding for the WISH prevention program and I wanted to share a few things with you. Um, at present, um, should you uh, 
approve the funding for the 16500 for WISH, that's going to cover roughly 40% of the <coughs> program costs. So you can see the impact that that's going to have on our prevention program. Um, and I'd like to also clarify that the, um, the, this particular uh, funding covers the wages of our prevention uh, person. So when we say that it's funding girls on the run, we're speaking uh, for the wages of the, of the lady that coordinates those programs. And uh, she's very active, and we have Girls on the Run happening um, in the schools, and we've just now expanded Girls on the Run over to Craig, which is a new program this year, and Ms. Goucher is assisting in running that program over there, and we're really pleased about that. But Erica signed up to speak, and she'll share a little bit more about her programs. Um, I also wanted to let you know that uh, prevention also does lead on uh, project in the schools at KHI. Last year they um, ran the program and they were very, their program at that time was for uh, working and obtaining surveys, providing the information to the school board and to um, try to keep the counselors in the schools and they were very successful and the school board really appreciated the efforts of uh, these group of teens that worked hard on this project. This year the project is mentorship and uh, what occurs is in the, uh, in the fall there's a group of uh, youth that are sent up to Anchorage, they, they attend the Lead On conference, they select a project and our staff person works with them throughout the year to accomplish whatever their project is that they've selected and uh, it's been very successful and, and it gets the kids involved and they learn the processes and they learn how to make a project successful. And uh, another project that we have is uh, um, the mentoring projects at KHI and at the schools. And there's another project that goes right along with that called our Compass Project. And the Compass Project has a curriculum and Matt Tibbles heads that one. And, uh, um, and uh, they have a project that uh, I would like to speak to uh, personally, and that's this project that's going on in Saxman. Um, I'm a Saxman resident, and uh, we started. He started the Choose Respect project by partnering with the Saxman IRA Council, and um, what occurs there is the men mentor the boys, and they had uh, took on a carving project to carve paddles, and along with that, they work a curriculum that teaches respect and teaches the values of, um, of um, the men to the boys. And, and it also, it's just a full rounded uh, curriculum and that Compass Project is led by the state of Alaska and um, I'm, I'm very proud because my daughter, Cheryl DeWitt, is one of, the, one of the ones who worked that curriculum up when she worked at WISH. So it's a project that uh, we hold close to our heart because uh, it's one that, again, I say teach teaches the boys respect at an early age, and then in, in the long run really affects domestic violence and sexual assault because you learn to respect your women. Um, the other um, project that uh, we have is, you know, championing the Choose Respect March. Of course, we have our partners that join us, and um, um, we have a number of project, uh, pr um, partners that join us that we're very proud to be able to hold hands with them and work to have our, our Choose Respect March. And um, it's just uh, something that I don't want, I want to see grow. I don't want to see our prevention program be hindered just because we don't have the funds to be able to carry it on. Um, the, um, um, I also do uh, respect the council because you, you are doing your due diligence and in requesting information for it from WISH regarding our probation, and um, as you read the letter, um, and, and Ben has uh, made himself available, I'm the finance manager for WISH, and I would make myself available to answer any questions when you get to that agenda item also. Do you have any questions of me? Thank you very much, Nora. Thank, Thank you. you. Celeste Clay. and my daughters have 
use the Girls on the Run program through um, the, it, it, I don't know what to say. It's just, it's an amazing program and I would hate to see that it doesn't continue to uh, function if um, the monies aren't there. Um, so I hope y'all continue funding this. Thank you, thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Sean McFarland. Thank you. I'm uh, Sean McFarland. I'm a <clears throat> civil engineer with Moffin and Nickel Engineers, and I'm uh, here to uh, uh, support uh, the city and uh, answer any questions you might have on uh, new business item uh, 7A1, which is the, um, the cruise uh, terminal planning uh, project. And uh, this is a project that uh, you uh, endorsed the award to Moffin and Nickel on your December 3rd uh, meeting. I was here present at that meeting. Uh, subsequently, um, spent time uh, with uh, Steve Corporan with his cruise agency folks here on uh, January 13th. We spent the day uh, walking the docks and, and meeting to come up with a, a scope of work and have put together a, a proposed uh, scope of work and contract. And um, here to answer any questions you might have um, towards that tonight. You bet. Stick around and see if we have any questions. We'll do. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Keith Smith. Good evening, my name is Keith Smith. I live at 1260 South Street and I'm here representing Southeast Alaska Independent Living. Uh, SAIL has, believes as many people in Ketch can do, that our taxi system, um, companies and taxis, provide an, an essential part of our transportation infrastructure. And we believe that that uh, infrastructure should be available to everyone in Ketchikan. To that end, SAIL has been working for some years to make the taxi system accessible and by either making all companies or one company at least uh, provide a wheelchair accessible uh, on-demand taxi system. And uh, we have just for informational purposes as part of that, we have gotten funding for one cab uh, and we are still looking for someone to operate that one cab. We have pending funding for the second cab in order to have redundancy within the system to ensure that it can be run uh, 24 hours if necessary, that there would always be a backup. Uh, we will hear about that funding on March 31st. And uh, since we haven't found someone to take, a uh, company to take the first cab, uh, we have gotten an extension from the Rasmussen Foundation for funding for that, but that extension runs out at the end of April. So there is a window here that we were hopefully want to work within. Want to thank the City Council who has already addressed this issue informally. Um, by uh, instructing management to look for possible solutions uh, with uh, and incentives for taxi cabs to make themselves accessible and we want to thank them for their efforts. Um, as we work together and move towards a solution to what we consider a very important issue, um, we thought it would be useful for you just to hear firsthand um, from someone in our community of what having an accessible cab might mean in one individual's life. And so I would like to introduce uh, Gwen McDonald, who with SAIL is uh, one of the ways we talk about our mission is that we inspire independent living. And so oftentimes I like to think of Gwen, I can't really say a poster child, I'd have to say a poster adult. Um, for uh, both the triumphs and the challenges of independent living. And I'm, I'm pleased to present her tonight and introduce her. Gwen. Thank you. I'm Gwen McDonald. I live at 3929 Baranoff Avenue. I am here to bring to the attention the high need in our community for a wheelchair accessible taxi. 
Five years ago, I fell from our loft in our home, from the attic loft to the main floor and crushed five vertebrae. I have no feeling or control of my body from my chest down. Previous to my fall, I taught uh, special needs preschool for 31 years, 28 of those years here in Ketchikan. And in addition to that, I also worked for Community Connections part-time for 23 years. I was unable to continue these uh, careers and life choices because of my physical limitations as well as losing a good part of my social and daily life activities. For a brief time after my return from to Ketchikan after medical treatment for a number of months in Seattle, I was able to um, access the wheelchair accessible cab that was operated briefly by a yellow cab. I lost many, even most of my chances to participate in these everyday activities and most, that most people might take for granted. These activities <coughs> would include simple things like running to the store, you know? Here's the dinner, whoops, forgot the main component. Well, how do I get that? Um, attending church activities, getting to the hospital to visit, or even more poignantly, the morning my husband had a heart attack and I didn't have transportation to get there. Picking up meds that I need immediately and I have to search for the kindness of someone to get them because I can't get there on my own. I have been and desire to be an active member of this community. I am asking you to do all you can as the city council to please praise it, please place this necessary service of a wheelchair accessible taxi in our community. As I have recently become employed, I have greatly appreciated the heroic measures of the senior bus that they have taken to get me to and from work on a sometimes flexing schedule, but they face many challenges with rapidly changing schedules and needs on my part. As I consider the possible life choices on an uh, and on a demand wheelchair accessible taxi would offer, I currently would not be able to run for city council because of the scheduled hours of the service of the bus system. I would not be able to stay for the entire meeting because the buses do not run that late. Please do all that you can to put this taxi into service and increase the accessibility of our community. I am asking to do all that you can as a city council. As I have recently become employed and wanted to, want to stay that way. And also, I want to be part of the community. I don't want to be the odd duck. Thank you. Thank you, Gwen. Keith, do you have anything else? No, but are there any questions? Bob? Yeah, a couple things, Keith. Yeah, um, public buildings. Oh, oh man. <laughs> <laughs> public right. buildings and public transportation such as the bus, are they required to have ADA compliant? Uh, as, as a purchase new or public, bill new? The ADA um, mandates that public transportation systems um, uh, by Title II be accessible. Um, in a recent uh, uh, ruling by the Department of Justice, um, they, and I got this information from the ADA hotline, um, they ended up ruling that the taxi cab system in New York had to be accessible, had to be an accessible system 
because it was the city of New York that was regulating that, regulating the taxi system. So there is the opinion, and it's important for you to consult in yourselves um, about this and even with your own um, uh, legal, uh, legal advice and your own lawyers. But, but there is the opinion that because the city regulates the taxi system, it should be treated as a Title II entity that absolutely should be accessible. Um, and, uh, and of course, like everything else, um, that, that is up for discussion and debate. Um, what we are eager as SAIL is to, to so much of accessibility uh, in our community, a lot of times is people coming together and problem solving and coming up with win-win solutions among everybody and not necessarily using the ADA as a hammer. But we feel in this particular case that many of the objections for providing the um, objections to providing this service do not stand up under scrutiny. And I think that I hope that we can collectively come to a way both with incentives and ordinance to ensure that this uh, this service exists. Thank you, Bob. I don't know how many years ago, but they rolled out two cabs with uh, chairlifts in them. Mm -hmm. Presently, those aren't operating? Um, there was one cab that was operated by Yellow Cab, and they operated it for a certain period of time. Sale uh, uh, obtained the funding and leased the cab to Yellow Cab. Um, uh, Yellow Cab then declined at a certain point um, to continue the service and returned the cab to sale and it is now um, uh, part of the accessible ta taxi uh, uh, system in Juno, which is now in place. So, so Juno does have accessible cabs. We then, having gotten funding for an additional cab, were seeking for, for a a company to lease that and to agree to operate it. Uh, it looks for a while the yellow cab might take that on. Uh, they they then backed out, and we are still looking for a partner. Um, uh, so what we have is one cab that we could buy tomorrow once we found someone to receive it, and we have um, we have another grant in with DOT. An accessible cab uh, uh, system for Ketchikan was the first priority on the consolidated uh, Revilla Consolidated Transportation Plan of this year. And, uh, and so that stands well. And we have another DOT grant, uh, along with uh, funding from the Rasmussen Foundation, that we're looking for the second cab. And we will hear about that funding on the 31st of March. Any other questions, Nick? Yeah, Keith, yeah. when you say leasing, do you mean do you get money back from them for using it? Or you just, or it's a. Well, it's well a what work? all that sale wants, no, we're not getting money back, but what we need is the agreement in giving them that they are going to be used. So okay. it has to be a contract where they are committing to providing the service in exchange for it rather than just giving it to them. Okay. So that's really what we're looking at is someone to operate them and there would be terms of agreement to ensure that in exchange for this community resources given to them that they fulfill um, their part of the bargain. Generally? What's been the hurdle on that as to why they don't want to do it or why they've turned in the cap well, previously? And, and, and this is something that, that I'm sure um, uh, 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 management here will have a full report on and them talking to them directly. Just the things that, um, there's two things that I've heard. One is that these cabs are more expensive and more expensive to maintain, except that um, that doesn't really hold up to scrutiny because there's a $10,000 tax credit you can receive from the federal government that costs, that, that, that covers 50% of uh, a, any expense for making your company more accessible. So if you imagine a $30,000 vehicle that is, um, that is purchased over two years, you would get $7,500 back from the federal government and basically the vehicle that you got would end up being cheaper than a normal cab for your system. So that, that to me doesn't really hold up. The only other part is 
and this to me is a little sad, it takes longer. Uh, to pick up any senior, it's not just a cabinet, to, take up, to pick up anyone who's moving a little slower takes a little longer. So really, if you, t right now someone with a walker, someone with a walker can be picked up by a cab because you can fold the walker up and put it in the cab, and that can take a long time. But you don't see, and you don't see because it would be illegal and we would all rebel, you don't see people refusing to pick up seniors and walkers. Well, it takes the same amount of time for someone in a wheelchair, too. But right now, the cabs are refusing to take the steps forward to do what is necessary in order to make their service available to these people that are in wheelchairs. Um, I'm sorry. I'm answering more than you need to and taking up too much time. Yeah, we got Bob one more question. Yeah. Well, I just suggest that we put this on a future agenda. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of discussion that seems to have to go on with this in regards to that stuff. Maybe Keith would be more prepared to bring some more of the information forward um, in regards to the, the leases and how that stuff all works. And the city may have some options to, for incentives. Uh, and we may have options and ordinances to mandate. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's something that we need to have our legal department look at. Thank you very, very much. Appreciate Thanks, it. Keith. All right, Thanks, next, please. Erica Paquet. I'm not sure about the last name, but I tried. Erica Paquet. Uh, um, and I am the Prevention Outreach Advocate for WISH. Um, the grant funding that you guys provide goes specifically to my, my position, so I'm just here to talk a little bit about the programs. Um, everybody has already talked about Girls on the Run, so that's like our flagship um, for my position program. Um, currently, we started yesterday practices in Ketchikan. We have 36 girls enrolled um, at three different schools. So I've gotten to talk, the beautiful thing about the Girls on the Run program is if the people can't pay, we provide scholarships. If the girls don't have running shoes, we provide running shoes. So now I've been talking to numerous parents just following up on their applications. Um, if they hadn't filled out the scholarship point and I get to, you know, say when somebody's like, oh, you know, I'm having a little trouble with money, no worries. Your girl can still participate. We don't ever turn anyone away um, based on based on the inability to pay. So I've got to have some really great conversations with parents. Um, the girls are all very excited. We have a great group of coaches. Um, it's a really renowned program. I've only been in this position since November, um, but already all the people speaking about the Girls on the Run program last year at the community 5K we have at the end, I think there was close to 200 people showed up. That's the parents, students, the running club, um, and just other community members who want to get involved. Um, it's an empowerment program. It teaches girls all about self-esteem. It's for the ages of third through sixth grade at that time, right before these girls are going to middle school, trying to get them um, to learn about what they're good at and what to love about themselves before they get hit with this, the peer pressure to become somebody else, to become some other girl that, um, that society wants you to be instead of the girl that you are inside. So um, it's a really uh, positive program. People can't say enough about it. The people who have done it, you know, come back year and year and s tell the, you know, say, I remember that program. I remember my coaches. Um, just, yeah, it's an all around great program. Like she said, we expanded to Prince of Wales this year. We have 18 girls. Um, not a lot of opportunities for activities over there. So we are very happy to be able to, to move over there. We have a great group of coaches, um, a great coordinator who volunteers her time to help me out with, um, getting all that together. Um, we have four girls that went up to the lead on this year. Um, and their goal, we wrote a grant for, got, got awarded a $2,000 grant to start a peer education group here in Ketchikan. Um, they're really excited about it. We're gonna start a peer education group that's gonna be lasting from year to year. It's gonna be another prevention tactic. So we have a lot of adults that are telling teenagers what they should do, but um, the new the new prevention is to have the kids, the kids empowering the, the students themselves to talk about um, dating violence or contraception or suicide prevention. Um, so we're starting this peer education group. We're going <coughs> to expand. Hopefully, we'll continue on. 
uh, in the next year and get a lasting program so these students can be empowered to take take the healthy choices, um, spread that throughout the community, and it also gives an, another aspect to the prevention where you have the the you know the youth talking to the youth, so you have that in with the at-risk youth who might be turned off by hearing another comment from adults about what you should or shouldn't do. Uh, so we're really excited about this. Our grant, what we are told by the people who gave it to us, was one of the best in the state. They selected three groups. We are one of them. Um, so yeah, we're really excited about that. Um, last week I started a group with girls at in middle school at Revilla. Um, so that's going to be a bi-weekly thing where we just meet and again talk about um, whatever they want to talk about. Bullying, social media abuse, technology abuse, sexting. Um, I did a little informational survey just you know anonymously to see what they thought. Two of the girls answered um, that they, and, and I don't know which two was anonymous, you know, have attempted suicide, who know people who have committed suicide, um, who feel like they have problems that are unsolvable. These people are, they don't, you know, they don't have enough adults in their life that they feel like they can talk to. So the Prevention and Education Department, that's just one of our goals, is to be another person in the community that these students can feel safe to talk to, to safe to get real information about too, because um, you know when you are getting information through the school district, a lot of times they have their agendas and they can't talk about this or they can't talk about that, well we kind of have the freedom to say, okay these are your options, you know, we, we don't tell people what to do as advocates, um, we're just there as another source of information. Um, they talked about the Compass group, um, we're looking to expand that and modify the curriculum. It is written for males, but we're hoping to start it really soon with, with females as well. And another thing about the Girls on the Run program, it's a, you know two hours after school, two times a week, and we're really trying to hit with all our prevention are these at-risk youth. So the way I see it is these girls are going to, you know, Girls on the Run, this might be two hours that they don't have to go home to an abusive household or a parent who is drinking. Um, or you know we feed them a snack and water and they have somebody tell them that they're a great person and that they love them and we care about what is going on and I mean we so, see so many youth in this community where we know that's not happening that they're not going home and they are never hearing that they are good at something or that they can be something and in the pre prevention and education that's our main goal is to empower these students to be another person who's telling them yes you can you can move past um, whatever obstacle you think is in your way. There are resources available. Um, so expanding the Compass program and um, with the passing of Aaron's Law, of course, the school district is going to have to start. And I know this is something pre the prevention had done before, is teaching about safe and unsafe touch in our schools. Um, at some point, it kind of, went, um, you know, there's been a lot of turnover in my position. That's, I guess at some point it stopped, but we're working with getting back into the schools, teaching these kids how to recognize um, signs of abuse and what to do if they're being abused. I mean, this is something we know is going on in our community. Children are being sexually abused and nobody's talking about it and that's what we're here to, you know, constantly bring that awareness. Um, so when you're funding this position, I mean, you're just, it's, um, you're funding these youth programs and I don't, I considered coming here but I keep waking up at night and it's not about my job you know I'll be fine if my funding's cut and come December I don't have a job but I keep waking up at night thinking about the youth who are going to suffer if these programs get cut and I can't sleep at night thinking about that so I'm just going to ask you to reconsider uh, or consider yeah funding my position again so we can keep doing things for these things for the youth in the community who will hopefully grow up to be our next set of leaders and we want our community to be healthy. We need these kids to, to grow up and to like where they live and I don't know. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? Okay. It was amazing that my three daughters never complained about me telling them what to do. <laughs> to your face. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that you're aware of. <laughs> they told the rest of us, of course. Yeah. <laughs> ah, Mr. O'Brien. I wait for you every year. Well, you know. <laughs> but is it that month already? Is it that time? <laughs> um, top of the evening to you all.
<laughs> My name is William O'Brien, and I live at 1428 Ferry Chasm. That would be in Bear Valley. <laughs> My request to you is very insequential to what I have sat here and listened to. And I had a little spiel about, uh, I'll be wearing the green, but you'll be talking about smoking to the green. But I'm not going <laughs> to I would never bring that up. Careful. <laughs> so, <laughs> so once again, we are now upon, this would be the fourth annual, the fourth annual St. Patrick's Day Parade held in Ketchikan, Alaska. Um, and as I see it, I don't think any other city in Alaska actually has one or promotes it. Um, so this will be the fourth annual. I request on the date of Sunday, March 13th, and the reason why it's Sunday is St. Patty's Day is on the 17th, which is Thursday, and it's a leap year, and blah, blah, blah. I'm not ready to ask Carl or anybody to shut the streets down on a regular business day. And we've been very, very fortunate in the last three years to, to have it on a Sunday. Um, so it will, and I'm not changing the route like I've done the last past three years. <laughs> so it begins, if you could, at two o'clock, birth four, run down, and then end up at uh, Salmon Landing. Uh, just like we did last year, um, we bring in once again some entertainment from Seattle that will be playing at uh, one of the local taverns in that area, of Salmon Landing, and and that. Um, and so it's two o'clock. I think we counted, or we, the parade last year took about maybe twenty minutes. Um, and it, you know, but this way, this year I think it might be twenty-five minutes. <laughs> um, one of the the things that as far as the theme of the parade, um, I really want to promote the First City Council on Cancer. Um, see, <laughs> here you go. <laughs> I have been uh, blessed with uh, a little bit of Hodgkin's and went through some things, and everything is great on my end, but it has really truly opened my heart with what this city and First City Council on Cancer and also the people who have dealt with cancer, survived cancer, lost people for cancer, all that. So we're going to have a, a bunch of survivors and, and things like that. It's Really, that's going to be my theme. And I'm not sure how we're going to call it yet. It'll be fun. Like, I wish I had cancer. I don't think that's going to be the one. <laughs> but we're, we're working on that. And, you know, just, but the one thing is, is we'll all have little green ribbons to, you know, acknowledge. And actually, Hodgkin's lymphoma is the green ribbon as, well, breast cancer is, I realize that there's every different type of cancer has different type of colored ribbons. So anyways, I'm, I'm requesting for the, esteemed city council and, and, and the honorable mayor to once again approve uh, the St. Patrick's Day Parade. And um, if there's any questions, I am here. And I don't see any questions and uh, we'll make yeah. sure you make sure you talk to the management and we'll get it taken. I, I, I will send him all the information. I will also discuss it with the chief of police. Thank you. And uh, we'll in involve the fire department and, and all that. So. Thank you. Glad Thank you, you very home. much for your time. I appreciate it. Cheers. Gigi. I'm sure you thought you got rid of me when I moved <coughs> out into the borough, but uh, wrong again. Uh, my name is Gigi Pilcher, and I do live at 243 Wood Road. <coughs> However, I'm here tonight uh, <coughs> in part because of my six-year-old grandson, who is a resident of the city of Ketchikan. And I'm not going to be asking you for any money, but I am going to be asking you for something. Um, it was, I believe, last Saturday, I had my six-year-old grandson, and we were down at the mall, because we often go down there on the weekends. And um, he, <clears throat> we were walking down the way, and all of a sudden he ran away from me and ran over to a wall 
And I went over, and he had put his little hand up <clears throat> on a poster that's hanging in the mall. And he says, Grandma, he goes, that's my Uncle Gary. He goes, <clears throat> he's missing. He's, he's my, my other grandma's brother, and he's been missing, and it makes my grandma sad, and she cries. And um, he said, I really want my Uncle Gary to come home. I also have been in contact over a period of time with um, a couple other people that <clears throat> can't be here tonight because they live in uh, another state, but they have a loved one who is missing. And um, they asked if I, you know, I said I was going to be coming tonight, and they said, would I bring this up? Uh, <clears throat> in fact, she went on your Ketchikan website and sent you guys a message. I don't know if you know that, but it's there. I went and I looked. I clicked on it. It's there. Um, and it's from Irene Anderson. And um, as well as speaking with Gary Hamilton's sister, Bertha Paradovich, who's unable, she was just got out of the hospital and she's bedridden at this time. She couldn't be here. Why I'm here is, <clears throat> I also, for those of you who are on Facebook with me, know that I have a funny looking thing on my picture. And what that says is, um, for the dead and missing indig indigenous people, and it's a large, um, actually, movement down in Canada because there are um, numbers of scores and scores of native women are in excuse me, in Canada, they're indigenous women um, that have been missing for a very long time. And uh, they finally have brought pressure, I guess, on the, with a change in the government that they're going to have a commission looking into it. But why I'm here is um, I called my friend that works for the FBI in Anchorage after my grandson said this. And I, you know, I said, told her that there was these you know, missing people. She used to live here in Ketchikan worked at the DA's office, and now she's with the FBI. But uh, So I called her, and I said, there's these missing people. And there was a um, young woman, um, Angie Dundas, that was found dead floating in the, the Narrows. And then there's these. And they all have two things in common. And uh, I'm sure you all know what those two things in common they are. They're all Native. And uh, they all have family and friends who are grieving and ex very heartbroken that their loved ones have not been found. And I said, you know, what, you know, what do you do in a situation like this? And she goes, well, <clears throat> I said, because somebody mentioned the FBI. And she said, well, she said, actually, the FBI can come in to the community if they are requested by the city police or the city entities to come in and sort of come in and do an overview of the investigation. And she said that often helps people in the community that have complaints understand that the um, police um, have done or are doing everything they possibly can. And um, <clears throat> she said, but it has to be requested. Uh, Irene Anderson, if you look what she posted on your website today, uh, tells you that she also spoke to the FBI. She was also told the same thing. And I believe she put something in there about her conversation with the uh, police in, here in town. Now, in fairness, I have to say this. This is no criticism whatsoever of the Ketchikan Police Department or the Alaska State Troopers. Um, and other than, I believe, Irene and maybe Bert Pradovich, I certainly haven't spoken with um, the chief. Um, but they apparently have, and if you re look on your Ketchikan thing, I think Irene tells you that. Um, but what they would like is for the FBI, which wouldn't cost you any money, to come down and look into both the death or the events surrounding the death of, I, <clears throat> of Angie Dundas, 
as well as um, what's going on with the investigation. And maybe they're none, maybe it's just a coincidence, you know, unrelated. Um, but it's just that people feel that that certain segment of the population of the community feel would be maybe reassured by being told again that everything that can be done has been done or is being done. That's all I want to say. I, I don't know that you have any questions for me, but if you do. No, thank you for the information, Gigi. You're I did welcome. I know that. So, any well, other questions? Thank you very much. You're welcome. Matt. I know you guys like the video. I stopped reading. There ain't no pictures. <laughs> Thank you. There's pictures on the next one. Thank you, man. Oh, this is my brain. Yeah. I'm, making, uh, I'm making multiple <laughs> rounds. Okay. Let's see pictures on it. It wasn't good. All right, my name is Matt Tibbles. Uh, I'm the Education Prevention Services Manager at Women in Safe Homes. Uh, I want to invite you to engage in a larger vision tonight. As you consider the funding of the grant request for Women in Safe Homes, from Women in Safe Homes and ask questions of the Board of Directors of WISH, I would ask you to keep in mind a global perspective of violence prevention. In 2014, the World Health Organization published the Global Status Report <coughs> on Violence Prevention. In this report, the World Health Organization gathered as much data as possible from 133 countries represented in six different regions. After analyzing the data, they identified seven best buy strategies you can see them highlighted on page 22 of the report of this document. They range from developing safe, stable, and nurturing relationships between children and their parents and caregivers to promoting gender equality, to preventing violence against women, to victimization or to victim identification and care and support programs. Many of these strategies are built into the programming and evaluation pieces of the Education and Prevention Department of WISH. Uh, also in the report, the WHO, or the World Health Organization, made a very damning statement to the prevention efforts across the world. The findings, uh, and that is highlighted actually on page 27, uh, right here at the bottom right corner. The findings from the survey indicate that many countries are investing in prevention, yet none of the 18 prevention programs are being implemented on a level necessary to achieve significant and sustainable reductions in violence. No country is implementing violence prevention on a level necessary to achieve significant and sustainable reduction in violence. This means we will continue to live in a world of domestic violence, sexual assaults, and murder. Violence is a multifaceted problem. The handout labeled Catch a Can, Women in Safe Homes, yeah, that one, uh, is a report which completes every year and turns into the Alaska Network on Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault. This report is compiled for, uh, from other reports, is compiled along with other reports from around Alaska and used to show the state legislature how important education and prevention is to the state of Alaska. You can flip through the report and again see my department is utilizing many of the strategies the World Health Organization says are the best strategies and approaches. Not only is violence a multifaceted problem, but it needs to be addressed across many sectors. Uh, I want to highlight the many community partners we collaborate with. Uh, if you flip to uh, the third page of this WISH document, we, uh, we partner with the Ketchikan Gateway Borough School District, the Ketchikan Indian <coughs> Community, the Organized Village of Saxman, the, well, the Ketchikan Wellness Coalition, uh, the Ketchikan Police Department, the State of Alaska Public Health, uh, the Ketchikan Youth Initiatives, 
Optimum Health and Wellness, Aquila Gateway Center for Human Services, uh, Ketchikan Public Utilities, which we're currently in the filming uh, of, of a documentary uh, that highlights how toxic stress affects brain development of our youth in this town. <clears throat> One of the newest community partners for the Education and Prevention Department in this is the Alaska State Troopers. Captain Duxbury attended WISH's annual meeting and after my report to our membership, approached me to set up a meeting so that we could discuss how WISH's prevention efforts could partner with the Alaska State Troopers. Both WISH and AST are excited about the new partnership and the positive effects this will have on our, our island. As we have seen, as you have seen and, and read through the, the probation items from CDVSA, you can see none of them involve the Education Prevention Department. Yesterday at a meeting with the Ketchikan Gateway School, School Board, Gateway Borough School District, CDVSA representatives and myself, we were talking about prevention efforts across the state of Alaska and our efforts here in Ketchikan. After the meeting, a CDVSA representative stated, the education and prevention efforts of WISH are ahead, ahead of the efforts in most of the communities across the state of Alaska. Even CDVSA acknowledges and praises the, the prevention efforts WISH and our community partners and our friends are doing. I want, you to, I want to invite you to dream again. I want to invite you to dream of a world without violence where statements from the World Health Organization that say we are not implementing prevention on a level necessary to achieve significant and sustainable reductions in violence no longer can be made. I believe one day we will end violence. I believe in a world where love, respect, and dignity will be our core values. And they will help us direct all of our interactions with other humans. But in order to make this world a reality, we have to do the hard work today. Today, we have to make the prevention of violence a priority, and you can help us by granting our grant uh, proposal. Thank you for your time and your consideration. Any questions for Matt? <coughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, anybody else here to talk to the council? That was everybody that was on the list. Come on up, sir. <coughs> How's it going? I'm Sven Westergaard, 3720 Alaska Avenue. Um, just going to say hi. I'm uh, totally by myself. I'm third generation, fourth generation catch again boy. Uh, born at Ketchikan General Hospital, October 9th, 1984. I worked for KPU Telephone, and I plan to stay here. Plan to have kids here, God willing. If folks have their way, it'll be soon, but hopefully uh. not. <laughs> but uh, anyways, nice to meet you all, and uh, have a good one. All right, thanks. Anybody else? Okay. <coughs> My name is Lee Karski. I live at 12794 North Tongas. I've been a resident of Ketchikan nearly my entire life. I was born December 21st, 1977 in Ketchikan General Hospital. I am also a third generation Alaskan. And I also work for KPU Telephone. As of right now, um, the water is flowing. The lights are on. <coughs> I'm assuming people are watching me on TV and uh, probably browsing the internet more likely. But um, we're all working for you guys. Why aren't you working with us? Right now, we're still uh, negotiating our contract, which has been going on for the last almost 17 months. And uh, frankly, we're kind of upset that why you're stalling. What's the holdup? We're working for you. Why aren't you working with us? And I wish I could be more jovial, but this is really getting ridiculous. Um, <coughs> with all due respect, thank you. Good night. Thank you. Anybody else? Come on up. Not as tall as him. Tina Bredehoff, 3725 Baranoff. I also work for the city of Ketchikan, KP Telecommunications. Um, I've heard a lot of talk tonight about the community and bringing up our youth and how important that is. Um, one of the things that KPU does right now is has an, an apprenticeship program. And that is a program that allows people who were born here to have jobs for all of their life and to provide services to the community, be a part of the community, have a job within the community. And I don't understand as a council 
how we are hearing that you guys are not interested in pursuing that any longer. We're being told that you guys don't want to do that. And I, I can't understand why you wouldn't want to keep a program that continues to allow residents of Ketchikan a job going forward. That's all I have. Any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else? Seeing that, we'll move on into the agenda. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> All right, that takes us down to consent agenda. I'd like to add a few things. We already um, added that resolution from Dick 162618. I'd like to add to the agenda some of these things we already dealt with. Um, 6A, 1, 2, 3, and 4, B1 and 2, and 7A3. Seven, Eight, 7A3. And then on the unfinished business, I have them all but five. Okay. And then if we can have a motion to consent. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I, yeah. I, I kind of lost track there. Yeah, I'm sorry about um, that. Okay, here we go. Unfinished business A, one, two, three. Okay. Now those rate increases we've been okay, dealing yeah, with. Right. And then number four, which is just okay. the, 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 the time for the uh, yeah. Okay. And then B one and two. Okay. okay. And then a new business, just number A on that police department acquisition for the yeah. workstation. Three. Number three. Number three. Okay. 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 Do we have a motion to consent? Yeah, all right. Move to consent. Do we have second. a second? Move and second it. Madam Clerk, can you read the items, please? Approval of minutes, regular city council meeting of February 4th, 2016. Assignment of Tidelands lease, um, ADL 101082. Um, resolution number 2618-2618. Providing comment to the proposed amendment to the 2008 Tongass Land and Resource Management Plan. Ordinance number 16-1811. Amending the Ketchikan Municipal Code section 13.08.100 to increase dock charges for port use, second reading. Ordinance number 16-1807, increasing wastewater rates, second reading. Ordinance number 16-1809, increasing rates and fees for solid waste collection and disposal, second reading. Ordinance number 16-1812, amending chapter 5.20, of the Ketchikan Municipal Code, currently entitled Alcoholic Beverages, to change that title to Regulation of Alcoholic Beverages and Marijuana, second reading. Ordinance number 16, 1805, increasing electrical rates, second reading. Ordinance number 16, 1806, increasing water rates, second reading. And the acquisition of the Ketchikan Police Department dispatch workstations with Watson Furniture Group of Paulsboro, Washington. Thank you very much. Dick, do you want to um, go over your addition on that resolution so people I'm, know what we're doing? I'm going to be just real brief. I okay. think most people know what's going, may not know what's going on, but the Forest Service is up, uh, updating the Congress Land Management Plan mm -hmm. under the direction of the Secretary of Agriculture that you will transition <coughs> to Young Grove. And there's a number of issues in there that I guess I identified, the borough identified, the miners identified and the four associates identified as, as problems. And without going through all of them, I think they're pretty self-evident. If you've got a question, yell at me, but it basically deals with mining, uh, renewable <coughs> energy, uh, and the inventories and so forth, and, and economic analysis of the timber side of it. So we'll see if we get any action out of them. I don't know. Thank you, Dick. Anybody else? Call the roll. Harris? Aye. Ziggy? Yes. Siebertson? Yes. Kiefer? Yes. Gage? Yes. Isom? Yes. And Coos? Yeah. All right, that brings us down to unfinished business general government. Um, that is 6 5. Your um, Honor? Community grants wish. Yes. I move the City Council direct the City Manager to enter into a 2016 Community Agency Funding Agreement with Women in Safe Homes in the amount of 16500 as recommended by the Community Grant Committee 
and authorize funding in the amount of sixteen thousand five hundred from the two thousand and sixteen community grant program account number six ten dash o two. Moved and second, Judy. Uh, well, I'd like to thank everybody who's come out tonight and responded to the questions we had. I think that um, it's important that as a council, uh, we question where we give our money. And when we hear that there's a problem, it's important that we ask you questions. You've obviously demonstrated to us how dearly you think of your program and how hard you work. And I want to say I appreciate that. Thank you. Anybody else? Tolerance. Kiefer? Yes. Isom? Yes. Gage? Yes. Coos? Yes. Harris? Yes, ma'am. Severson? Yes. Zingy? Yes. All right, that passes seven to nothing. That brings us down to new business 7A1 order contract 1616 planning design board improvements <coughs> Moffat Nickel. Um, do we have a motion? Go ahead. Uh, I move the City Council approve contract number 1616 16, planning and design of the port improvements between the city and Moffat and Nickel. Any amount is not to exceed $249,835. Authorized funding from the Port Department 2016 planning and design of port improvements and capital account and direct the city manager to execute the contract document on behalf of City Council. We have a second. Second. Thank you. For discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Dick. Uh, I think it was a previous meeting or several meetings ago when we fixed this particular contract to do what we to do the improvement designs and some other investigative work. Uh, at that time, looking at what it was, the actual estimate of the uh, particular contract was considerably less than it is, which is a a concern and uh, part of that concern to me I think was explained by Steve in his letter that there was some changing in additional conditions and I guess that at some point in time I'd like for Steve to, to say a couple of things to us about uh, what those conditions were and had we picked the other contractor would they probably have this contract has probably gone up by a similar amount Come on up, Steve. The Port and Harbor's Director, Steve Corporon. Um, if you remember back to, I think it was November, December, whatever, the last time that this uh, agenda item was up, I, I politely tried to, to explain to you, don't focus too much on the estimated costs of the, ver of the two proposals that we have presented, because the, the scopes of the anticipated services w were not equal. Uh, PND's original proposal back in August was 195,000, um, and the scope of what is being proposed tonight is probably closer to that than the PND and, and Moffat Nickel scopes were in November. Uh, PND had worked with us for a number of years, knew our facility well. We had been talking off and on uh, these last couple of years about what we're going to need some stuff in the future. They knew many of the issues. We had talked about them trying to um, put all that in, in a request for proposals is difficult without going on and on and on. So when, we, when you get the request for proposals, you try to keep it as generic as possible uh, and to see what the, the, the approach they would take would be, um, what their rates would be, and things like that. Um, when those two initial proposals, the four initial proposals were, were presented, the team narrowed it down to two, Moffat and Nicole and Indy. Um, and when we invited them both up for the early October presentations to the committee, um, I tried to, to level the scope a little bit. Uh, Moffat and Nicole didn't have any public presentations in it. p and having worked with us over the years, knew that Ketchikan loves public meetings during design for, for big projects and that. Um, you know, so I said, well, assume at least three public meetings. Uh, but I didn't, I didn't go into overbearing detail on what would be expected during these public meetings. Um, but once we got Moffat and Nickel here in January, we spent an entire day with them. Two hours of that was spent with cruise line agency representatives. 
going over many of the issues that we know are out there, some of the assumptions we have, some of the, some of the, uh, the problems we envision, some of the things we'd like to see. Uh, then we spent the rest of the day touring facilities, looking at things, talking about this has been an issue, this has been an issue, things that you really can't put on paper and go out. Um, and we agreed, uh, they, they went back and put together a scope. There were no prizes on it. They wanted to make sure that we understood and we agreed upon a scope. Once we agreed upon the scope, that's when they forwarded, they, they, they priced it out and presented what, what, what you see before you tonight. Um, I think the big difference between this and say the P&D proposal for 195 back in August, uh, I think the renderings are, 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 are a big chunk of that. Uh, maybe a few more consultants at, at the public meetings. Uh, um, and P&D knew some of the projects that we would probably be looking at. We would want some conceptual designs worked up. So we had some decent estimates for budgeting in that. <laughs> Um, the Moffat Nickel one now contains stuff similar you know, as well as that. So that's how we got where we are. Um, and I, um, I tried to warn you about this back fall. Don't, work, don't concentrate on the price because once everybody understands what the scope is, no, no matter who we pick, the price is probably going to be in the same general area. So if you back out a couple of those items that I mentioned in the memo here, it's very close to what P&D's proposal was uh, initially out of the box. So I, I, it's not a case of bait and switch. It, it's not a, a case of them working towards the budget. Um, they actually, if I understand uh, their approach correctly, once they priced it out, they were over what we had budgeted. So they started cutting on their own and, and using some stuff to make sure they came in within our budget. Dave? This is a question for Steve. I'm just going to note that to a certain extent, this is their own fault. Because if you remember, staff said they preferred to work with the other group, and we said, well, work with this group. And at the time, they said, well, the other group knows us better. Well, this is the price we this pay. Is, this is the price we pay for that. Um, that said, I still think it's too big of a jump personally with this. And, and we are looking forward to working with Moff and Nickel. I don't want you to think that no, no. We're, we're recommending, oh, told you so we should no, no, down. No, no. we're not doing that uh, we've had some good conversations working up and there's uh, there's been some good ideas exchanged and I, I'm looking forward to getting something going what I don't want to see is this dragged out so that's why we kind of threw some numbers out here tonight so I would at least hope to walk away tonight that if you don't want to go with 249 and what they've laid out here give me a number so that we can get something going without dragging this out another month or two we're gonna start missing some, some important time periods here, you know, come April and May. So. Anybody else? Bob? Yeah, I don't, I, I don't particularly care for this. They came in at 130000 and, you know, you add another 10000 This is over 100% higher than their original bid. Um, Much different scope, though. Just, just they should have known more about what the scope was. When we looked at the two proposals, it was pretty obvious to me that P&D because of their experience here, knew more about what was going to be asked for in that proposal. And they were at 195. Um, uh, I, vote, I, I voted against uh, um, this one not because I didn't think they were a good company, but the experience is a big deal and it cost them this money today. Um, I can't support the 249. I don't know what we're going to get at. but. Um, You know, I, I guess I would have had, I would have thought it would have been a closer number. The guy tells you he's going to do the work that you proposed for 130000 I know there's going to be things added, but when it comes up almost 100%, that's unreasonable. Judy. Yeah, I voted um, for Moffat and Nickel because I thought, you know, that fresh eyes would be great. But fresh eyes for half the price, I'll go with the old eyes. I mean, that's a lot of money. And um, it's not that I don't think that they can do the job. It's just when you bid 133 and you come in almost, you know, $100,000 over that, um, yeah, I, I just don't think we should go this route. Dick? Yeah, I, I think a number of us, like Steve said, we looked at the price. The debt was nice. But we also said to ourselves we need to make a change in who the contractors are. 
And I think the question I asked of Steve back there was if we have dealt with the other contractors, would the price come out to about the same? Because they did talk about additional and different scope of work. So I guess I don't feel bad about the price. I don't like the fact idea went up. But I think we also probably know on these types of contracts it's going to go up or down depending on what we stick in the contract. And so I, I guess I think that we ought to get this thing moving. Otherwise, it's just going to drag out another or however long. I don't know. But, uh, I'm comfortable with this thing because we started out this way. I agree with Dick because when we talked about new eyes, which I have no problem. I remember doing this before. One thing I've warned you, the price never changes. It's always going to be. Um, close to the same the um, I would recommend it if you guys do go with this that we take that 31,000 out um, I don't I don't think that's a problem even though the management's recommend recommending against it so Dave I was just gonna say you know there's, you know, there, there, there's up and then there's almost 100 percent up I think that's the problem I have if we come back with a number of closer to 200,000 I feel a lot more comfortable with this should we do, do an amendment or what do you suggest you guys can make amendment. Do you guys want? Um, I just take the thirty-one thousand out, but maybe you got a Dick. Yeah, I'd, I'd make an amendment to take out the thirty-one thousand. I think we can probably deal with it. You know, if we see there's a problem, we can deal with that from that standpoint there. But I think we try to get this back to one hundred thirty thousand dollars. Scope of the contract goes all the poop, and we're not going to get the job we want from the from the contractor. So. Uh, uh, that would be one. Piece Do we have a second for that first? Yeah. Is there a second for that amendment? I'll second it. Thanks, Dave. Anything else, Dick? Uh, no. Anybody else on the amendment? Your Honor, for clarification, yeah. you can vote on the amendment and you Correct. can vote on the vote. Okay. Correct. Anybody else on the amendment? Call the roll. Severton? Yes. Coos? Yes. Zingy? Yes. Harris? Yes. Isom? Yes. Kiefer? Yes. Gage. <clears throat> yes. All right. That took 31000 off it. Um, anybody else on the main motion before we vote? Call the roll. Singy? No. Coos? Yes. Kiefer? No. Harris? No. Severton? No. Isom? No. Gage? No. All right. That fails 6 to 1. Um, yeah. You get up. So, Carl, where does that leave us? We would be looking to council for direction uh, relative to either, I guess, one of three options. One would be giving us a direction on a budget that we can go back and negotiate with Moffitt and Nickel um, if there's an inclination to start the process all over again. That, that's another option the council has. Um, have the option to direct us to go back and talk to P and D. I mean, anything is on the table. It's council. Yeah. Yes, Bob. Uh, can we have the representative come up? If he has anything that he wants to say at this particular point in time, or Steve, I guess you. Should. I'd like to add one thing, and I would like Sean to come up. Um, yeah. um, and he can correct me if I'm interpreting this wrong. A lot of the scope increase between their proposal and where we were at tonight, uh, it, a lot of it was due to conceptual design work. Um, which is something that we envisioned design work would come out of the initial contract. I mean, it would be a byproduct of the initial contract. There would be additional work down the road. Um, we're, some of that conceptual design work is actually part of this contract. Now, once we had them on site and talked about some of the, the options we had and some, some of the uh, uh, timelines we'd be facing over the next couple of years, it was imperative that we had some good budget numbers, which would take some some fairly detailed conceptual design work to come up with those decent budget numbers so we can start getting some requests in for the CPV funding from the big pot from the state. So don't get wrapped up on, yeah, it was a big scope increase. This is work that if we weren't paying for in this one, we'd be paying, paying for it on the next contract as we go forward with more conceptual design work. So. Yeah. Did 
No, I, I agree with everything that, uh, that Steve said, and, and I understand the, the council's concerns, and it does uh, appear to be a significant increase in the, uh, in the budget for the work. There is a significant increase in scope as well, as, as Steve has alluded to a couple times. We've, um, uh, during the December 3rd meeting, uh, I believe uh, um, the um, figure for uh, you know, the, the budget for this project, as well as some of the ideas of this conceptual work, was discussed, so that was out in the open that it was you were you were looking at about a, a two hundred fifty thousand dollar project. So, when Steve asked us to uh, to come to town in January, and we did that on our own nickel, we brought our, our three subject matter experts to town to to do the scoping meetings with the city and with um, with cruise line people. Um, we uh, we left town with the intent of putting together the scope in about two weeks, and uh, uh, came to agreement up front with Steve that. Uh, We'd like to. Uh, we'll, there's two ways you can t you can do these kind of things. Either you say, okay, do you want to outline the items you want in the scope, or would you like us to try and build a scope that is of best value to the city within the the budget that's already been been put out, um, you know, kind of publicly in the open. And, and <coughs> Steve and I agreed. Let's take a look at the second uh, tact. And what would you guys uh, recommend? And uh, following the meetings with the cruise line agencies, we did come back with a, a scope of work that we we. Um, um, felt that we could get done for within within that budget. Gave it to Steve, as he said, without the without the cost to make sure that we had the right level of effort. It seemed to be the right level of effort. Um, we priced that out and came out to around two hundred seventy thousand dollars. And um, we um, we've elected to make some uh, you know concessions on our part. Our our subject matter experts, uh, some of whom are coming from the East Coast, will be traveling on their own time. I will be traveling on my own time. We're only billing you part of our travel costs to bring that uh, down to the figure that you have in front of you, and, and that's uh, just a, a gesture of our eagerness to work with you and, and to help you come up with this. And then I, I guess I would just uh, wrap up by saying that we're uh, we are very eager to uh, help you with this project, to work with you. Um, I'm uh, very eager to work with Steve um, uh, towards negotiating this down to whatever uh, scope and budget you would be comfortable. Uh, I think it would be a, a, a significant challenge to bring the uh, scope that we now feel that is, is the right level of effort down to something like the 130,000, which is based on the initial uh, RFP. But uh, I would like to ask for the, uh, the opportunity to um, work with Steve and, uh, and staff to uh, negotiate something that uh, will be to your satisfaction. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, Bob. Steve, is there any money that times out on this as we move forward? Is there anything that we have to be concerned there? No, this is not with grant funding. This is, this is with uh, Port Enterprise funds. Um, so th there's there's no timeout on, on, on the funding on this. The, the, the timing was just, I know, you, as we start slipping, you know, a, a month or two here and there, is turns into a year when, when things don't line up as far as getting projects started. Thank you. Do we have some direction? Um, your Honor, yeah, yeah. I, I would still like Steve to, to go back and work with him a little bit. Uh, we've talked about taking the thirty thousand out, which was I think appropriate. Um, and if we can and go back and bring us back another proposal, I'm not saying that we're going to throw the baby out with the bathwater or anything like that. It's just that um, I hate to see a, a situation where it seems like a contractor lowballs the number either due to unanticipated cost not knowing the project or, or whatever that is and then we come back with a significantly higher number and that concerns me and, and um, so I, I'm not opposed to you to going back and, and I guess you know I didn't have enough explanation of I thought we are comparing apples and apples when we went out with this thing and if we weren't then um, I was uh, I guess um, I misunderstood that um, Council, do you have any problem with that direction? Do we want to give him a number, though? I, mean, I, I would like to give him a number of around two hundred thousand. I'd go with that. Too. Well, the number with the thirty thousand out is about two hundred thousand. two twenty. I think all we're doing delay in this. I mean, I can't reconsider, but it's been pretty clear to me that we want this work done, and this is what it's going to cost. Whether we could whittle it down, I guess we could whittle it down, but it's still within the budget. And and pulling it down is, I guess, it's one meeting away. We could come have something come back, but I, 
We want the job done. This is what's going to cost. Well, agenda so statements are due to Carl Tuesday next week, so this is not going to be on the March 3rd meeting. Plus, I'm not going to be here for the March 3rd meeting, so it'll be the March 17th meeting. It may be later than that because I will not be at the March 17th meeting. Your Honor? Yes. Katie, if I asked for a motion to reconsider, would we take that up today? Yes. I move to reconsider. I move to reconsider. Second. Moved and seconded. Call the roll. Just a second. Take your time. Gage? Harris? No. Isom? Yes. Kiefer? No. Coos? Yes. Severton? Yes. Zingy? No. Yeah, it fails. Um, we have direction. At this point, we've got up given a direction to come back um, if around 200000 Does anybody have a problem with that? No. All right. Let's start with that and see what you bring back. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Sean. All right, that brings us down to 7A2, contract, hole in the wall, harbor replacement. We have a motion. <clears throat> Your Honor. Yes. I move the city council authorize the city manager to direct Western Dock and Bridge LLC to perform additional repairs to the breakwater as part of the contract number 1524, hole in the wall, harbor replacement project, in amount not to exceed 220000 with the actual change order amount to be established and approved by the city council after application of available credits upon completion of the additional work. Second. Moving in a second, Bob. Uh, Steve, come up, explain what we're doing here. I got an idea. <laughs> <laughs> Port and Harvest Director Steve Corpro. Um, they're on site right now doing the floats. They have four piles left to put in tomorrow. Uh, of, the, of the 15, piles that we didn't think they, there's a good chance they wouldn't have to sock it. They have not had to sock it, any of those, and the four are the four outermost ones. So it looks like we will indeed have probably $120,000, give or take, uh, in savings in not having to drill those, plus some other work associated with that. Um, that coupled with the anticipated um, remaining amount of the um, contingency, we should be able to replace all the piles on the breakwater, put frames on the top, um, and beef up flotation uh, within the current approved budget for the project. But we don't have time to get all those numbers because the fish window closes March 15th out there. No pile driving after March 15th. So that's why I was, I was seeking approval on the concept tonight and the rough order of magnitude on the, on the numbers. And, and I was hoping they would have, we'd have a good idea if we'd have have to drill any of those by today, and, and I'm very confident we're not going to drill any of those 15. Um, and then we'll bring back a, a change order one and final for the job like we normally do. Uh, it's just because this one was such a magnitude, I was uncomfortable doing that without having you guys buy into it first. So, yeah, Bob. Yeah, I know that it needs to be done. I was out there the other day while they were getting ready to set the ramp. It looked like they're moving along pretty good. Um, if we can get that done this year, I think that's that good order of business. To get. And I was walking on those floats today. They are really nice. Good. <laughs> they're, they're really, really steady. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Call the roll. Coos? Yes. Sievertson? Yes. Isom? Yes. Gage? Yes. Zingy? Yes. Harris? Yes, ma'am. Kiefer? Yes. Yeah, that passes seven to nothing. That brings us down to. Um, 7B1 ordinance 16, 18, 13, amending chapter 11, 12, telecommunication services and rates. First reading some DSL changes, which I believe have already taken place, but we need to do it yeah. officially. I move the city council approve in first reading ordinance number 16, 18, 13, amending chapter 11.12, telecommunication service rate of the Ketchikan Municipal Code, providing for a public hearing and establishing an effective date. Second. Good and second, Bob. Do you have anything to add? Um, not unless Ed has something to explain that he, he thinks we don't know. <laughs> in regard to now, this is already in, this is already in place, Ed. It's already in place. I have no idea what's going on. Okay. <laughs> Call the roll, please. Uh, Harris. Aye. Zingy. Yes. Sievertson. Yes. Kiefer. Yes. 
Cage? Yes. Isom? Yes. Coos? Yes. All right, that passes seven nothing. That brings us down to seven B2 Operation Support System Partnership Copper Valley Wireless LLC. Do we have a motion? That's a long one. I move the City Council to approve a five year operation support system agreement with Copper Valley Wireless LLC in the amount of 58000 plus any time and materials expenses that may be required. Authorize the funding from the Telecommunication Division's 2015 rents and leases, infrastructure account number 654.04. Do we have a second? Second. Carl, do you want to explain what we're doing here? Ed, do you want to come up? <laughs> he, he can do a better job than I can, Mr. Mayor. Ed, Ed Cushing, Division, uh, Telecommunications Division Manager. As you know, we operate a 4G LTE wireless system, which we use to roam data for Verizon uh, wireless customers. One of the core pieces of equipment that enables that system to operate is called an OSS, or an operational support system. <clears throat> there are three LRA companies, just like KPU in the state of Alaska, doing this. We are one, MTA is another, and Copper Valley and Valdez is the third. The three of us have a choice. We can each operate an independent OSS, in which case our expenses annually are three times X, or we can have one OSS that the three of us share, which is what we're presently doing, um, in which case every year when the OSS is upgraded, if it is, we split the expenses, and we share the monthly expenses. So this represents a five-year agreement where in which for um, over the course of five years, roughly $56,000, this authorizes us to spend that much with Copper Valley to provide the uh, behind the scenes support of their OSS, our share of the OSS, if that makes sense. It's not very much for five years. No, it's a, it's should, a should great like another, deal. Another no, it's a great deal. Uh, it's, it's really it's a great deal, but it does exceed, it is for five years, and it does exceed 50000 which is why it has to. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm sure this is zero. We're missing there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Less well, time and material. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> less time. Yeah. Less time. <clears throat> Call the roll, please. Kiefer? Sure. Isom? Yes. Gage? Yes. Coos? Yes. Harris? Less time and material, yes, ma'am. Yes. Davidson? <laughs> yes. Zini? Yes. Yeah, it proves 7 nothing. That brings us down to vouchers. Catch Ken Daily News, $4,196.37. Do we have a motion? Your Honor. Go ahead. I move for approval of vouchers to Catch Ken Daily News in the amount of $4,196.37. Do we have a second? Second. Moved and second. To call the roll. Sewerton? Yes. Coos? Yes. Zingy? Yes. Harris? Yes, ma'am. Isom? Yes. Kiefer? Yes. Gage? Yeah. All right, that passes um, 7 nothing. brings us down to manager's report. Do you have anything to add, Carl? I do, Mr. Mayor. I have three real briefly. Tuesday night, the borough approved in their introductory hearing uh, the tobacco excise tax. I'm uh, looking forward to copies of that ordinance. It will be heard again uh, by the Assembly at its March 7th meeting if the Council wants to make comment on that ordinance. Uh, we can communicate that to the borough. I also laid on the table tonight uh, a memorandum from Mr. Cushing regarding KPU exiting from the NECA DSL pool. Uh, essentially, the recommendation is based on the fact that we've become a net payer uh, and we're not deriving any revenues from the pool on, on the DSL. Uh, if we continue to be in the pool, uh, our annual expense could be as high as $300,000. So we're recommending we exit the pool. That's a decision we have to notify NECA uh, by March 1st. If the council doesn't have any objections to that, that's how we'll proceed. No problem. And lastly, per Councilmember Coos's request, we did provide a report on the different funds uh, that the city has available. And that's in the agenda. So that's so, all I've got, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, I have two things. Um, the cruise ship schedule and I've been talking to the guys down at Berth One they've been talking to me about having moving um, 
princess um, every other week from birth two to birth one. Um, I, you know, I've talked to both um, Cruise Line Agency and um, people, and I have no problem coming up with doing that, giving a uh, ship down there two times a month. I've seen future, looks like schedules in the future, and there's no relief in um, that section for them in the near future. So I'd like, if there's four hands, I don't know if we need to make this a agenda item or if there's four hands for the council to at least direct uh, to the cruise light agency that um, we'd like to see um, that um, princess boat switched every other week um, i'd like to do that if there's four people interested get on it yeah is there any cost to that nope okay what's the what there's gotta switch? be something what's yeah the, <laughs> thank you dave what's the hitch <laughs> yeah what's the hitch i guess I, since this is something we haven't spent a lot of time dealing with i guess i'm concerned that i'm gonna say yes and then Get my that. phone will start reading then let's make it an agenda item at the next meeting please yeah. Lou, what was the switch and moving that every other week moving the print ship from birth two to birth one to the one? mayor before the one. i think i it would be prudent if you might hear from the Port and Harbors director yes. for a final decision. I know, but I'd rather make it an item instead we of can do that. tonight. Thank you. Port and Harbors director Steve Corporat. That's all right. You can talk. Oh. I want to make it, I yeah. mean, if you have something quick, but I still want to make an agenda. Okay. I will not be here for the March 3rd meeting. This is usually going to print right about now. Mm -hmm. um, the, the Marine pilots are not in favor of it. The Princess is not in favor of it. I am not in favor of it. That's all I have. Thank you. Otherwise, go right in. Otherwise, go right in. 150 foot walk. The, um, it's just, it, is there four people who want to put it on the agenda? Well, I, I guess. Four hands. <clears throat> why is Cruise Lines in favor of it and what else is supposed to be? Cruise Line isn't in favor of it. Oh. The only person in favor of it right now is me. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Are there four council members that want to see this as an agenda item? Not if we're printing schedule out. Seeing that, it won't be an agenda item. Um, the <coughs> other thing is the note here we got from Representative Ortez wanting to use the um, Civic Center. It doesn't say he wants it um, at no cost. Um, Carl, was that? Um, brought up or I think that's the presumption okay. that they would like it at no cost now is this a, so one of his um, events or is this coming from the governor's office it doesn't look like it's coming from the governor's office so I do have concern there because um, we do have an election year and um, then we'd have to give Bob free use to it I know. <laughs> um, yeah. that's why the request is for <laughs> Yeah, we don't want to show. And, uh, yeah, we don't want to show. So um, on this thing, you know, last time I guess it was the it's department that right? requested. This is Dan in his office. I don't know what the status is. I mean, how we deal with that in the past. Or? It's been mixed results. In some instances, the council has declined to make the civic center available, uh, particularly if there are political implications. Okay. Um, at this time, unless there's um, some people against it, I'd say we send back, if we can uh, give him that time, great, but it's going to have to be paid for. Yeah. Anybody have anything money. else? Okay. Um, that's all I had on everything. Does anybody else have anything else, Dick? Yeah, uh, a quick question for Carl, whoever. In the uh, Public Works report, we're talking about the, the roller coaster road on Bodden and uh, Bruce Mill Way, and it says something about expected completion in 2016. If you haven't been through there, it's getting worse, and 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 we need to do the timing so the buses. Otherwise, it's a mess. We had a public works meeting yesterday, and we talked about that. You'll be getting a report for the March 3rd meeting that addresses that. This is going to be an ongoing problem, but our intent is to do some remedial work prior to the cruise ship season to try to flatten things out. Okay. We'll have a report for you at the next meeting. Good, thank you. Anybody else? All right, see nothing on the manager's report. Where's the rest of my agenda? City, city clerk's file, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, nothing. Yeah. 
<laughs> City Attorney's report. Good morning. Future agenda items, we have the cab one, um, correct? Yes. Okay, and then um, Mayor and Council comments, KJ. I um, want to thank, I believe it would be the Streets Department of Public Works or whoever for fixing the parking up at uh, Grant Street. It's been a, used to be a lot of tickets passed out, now they put two, two new parking places in today. So I believe my neighbor had a lot to do with calling the city or calling the public work. But anyway, the job was fine. I'm happy with that. And I'm going to Seattle next Wednesday for a week of marijuana research just to help out the city. Thank you. <laughs> of Seattle? Yeah. <laughs> All right, Dave. Nothing wrong. Bob. Um, you know, I'd like to thank Gigi for coming forward and talking about the uh, the concerns. Um, we, uh, I, I've been meeting with a group that's looking at uh, addressing some of this just for an event and closure in regards to the missing people and other issues within the community. Um, domestic violence and, and drug abuse and stuff like that. Um, and uh, the police department did come to that group of about, I don't know, was it 15 people or something. Uh, I asked them if they would come and explain where they were at, and they did that. And I appreciated that very much. Um, and so I, I'm sure Carl will talk to Alan about the request from UG and figure out what they want to do with that. But, um, uh, it's. Uh, it's a sad thing, and there's no closure for some of those people, so um, we care. Thank you, Bob. Julie? Just a thank you to everyone who spoke tonight, and especially Erica, but she's gone. She was the, she's the program director, from what I understand, of Girls on the Run. That's all. Janelle? <laughs> um, yeah, just a thank you to all the WISH people who came out. Um, I spent the last couple of years working with a lot of those people on their projects and different projects um, for the community and just, I, I appreciate everybody supporting them. Judy. Um, I'm glad we're putting the handicapped taxis on the agenda. I think um, Gwen's statement was moving and uh, she works in the, you know, in the plaza so I see her struggle every day. And um, I really think that we need to do something about this and not kick the can down the road. That's it. Thank you. Nothing, Dick. Your Honor. Nothing. What? Nothing. All right. Nothing. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure? Yeah, you, want to think you told me I couldn't talk. <laughs> That's true, I did. <laughs> but you never listen. <laughs> Usually. <laughs> all right. Um, I don't have much. First of all, I. Um, well, talking about cabs, we lost Bar Goals, Gar Goals, um, mm. this last week. Um, he ran the two of the cabs in town. I'm so I condolences go out to the family. They've been here a long time. Um, so that was sad to see. Um, I'm glad it's be on the agenda. We can take care of that. Um, radio. I can't make it tomorrow. Can anybody make the radio program? I think I can do that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Bob. And then um, on the doc thing, you know, I, um, I'll come and push a little harder next year. I really, um, the way they have it set up, I know it's nice, but we could have, um, we could have done something, but I'm not gonna beat a dead horse, but um, I think this problem is going to, or concern is gonna, between some of our merchants is gonna come up again, and, and um, it's something that we should be um, prepared for to hear. Um, the last thing is, um, I, I thought I had another issue. Something with, oh yeah, I was happy to see they have that portable power washer now. I see going around, spraying up, cleaning up over by Creek Street and everything. And um, I'd love to give a list, Carl, to you guys of areas that I see that would be just perfect for that machine. By, by <laughs> and if they can't do it, I'll be happy to do it because I love the power wash. It's Can I take sport. pictures of you doing that? <laughs> oh, I love power wash. Buy another single hand to give it to you. <laughs> just in case they need help. The city up. <laughs> I, but I, um, there's some spots that have always bugged me, and I'll just throw it out there to you guys and see if um, you guys can hit those areas. But that's a great contraction. Um, and I just, um, I just love to see it. It just cleans up things. There's a lot of, um, 
areas and buildings that are um, needing some cleanup. You know, something I do down at the Daily News, I try to keep that building looking decent. And I encourage everybody to get, get out there. I know things are um, tighter. Maybe not everybody has all the money to do um, the cleanups and fix-ups, but um, I hope they do their best. Um, this season has been pretty um, mellow, so um, you know, mold and green is growing everywhere. So I hope we can all tackle it this spring and uh, spruce it up before the first of the summer and, um, and our guests start showing up too. So, But just keeping the community um, clean is a great thing to do for our, our town. So. That's my soapbox. Um, anybody have anything else? Do we have a motion to adjourn? So rude. Let's get out of here. I don't want us. I don't care what he has to say. I want to go home. It's all I forgot all about, about it. So that brings us down to item number 15. KPUB 1, request for executive says Rue City of Ketchikan, KPUL. 4G LTE wireless network business plan. Do we have a motion? Your Honor. Go ahead. Based on the Assistant General Manager's memorandum dated February 9th, 2016, I move the City Council find it is in the City's best interest to consider those matters in executive session. And as the Council go into executive session under KMC 2.04.025A and 1A1, to review and discuss the business and competitive aspects of KPU implementing. 4G LTE wireless network business plan, the knowledge of which cl would clearly have an adverse impact upon the finances of the city of Ketchikan. Second. Good and second. Call the roll. Sorry, Robert. I didn't get that. Singy. <laughs> yes. What does Siri say? Coos? <laughs> yes. Kiefer? No. Siri didn't get Harris? that. Harris? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Sievertson? Yes. Isom? Yes. Gage? Yes. <laughs> No All right, specific passed. action is required. <laughs> Let's adjourn out this meeting and turn down the room. We have way too many executive sessions. Session at this time, there's no further action. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved. Thank you, everybody. Thank Thanks. You. And I even thank the staff.